Welcome again to this series on becoming God's voice of purpose in your generation throughout your whole life and the seasons that um, are younger than you, the generations that are younger than you. Last time we talked about being an impact for your whole life. And we talked about remaining vital spiritually because you need that if you're going to be a voice of God. We talked about having the interest of Jesus Christ in the people around you and the people you're trying to reach. And then we got to this point where through the word, we realized that you don't have a choice in the matter. That's what God designed us to do. That's what he put us here for. We looked at the three seasons of life and their characteristics and the opportunities and the difficulties that might be there. Today, we want to look at the self-inventing stage of life and other people have a goal and a role in this. We will look at David as an example and see what lessons God might teach us from there. So let's look at the self-inventing season. What does it look like? And we're saying this is from zero to 30, thereabouts, um, from childhood to teens to being a young adult. There are four areas in this season of inventing yourself. There is seeking acceptance. Am I accepted? Am I loved? What do people think about me? What do my parents think about me? What do my teachers, what do my siblings think about me? Do they accept me as I am? And then there's the love of God, which normally at this stage as a young person may be difficult to understand, but God uses people around us to show us that he loves us. And so people, we need to know that at this stage, you are the one as an older person who shows the love of God to a person in this stage and the acceptance of God. Then there's a second area, which is competence. What am I really good at? What, am I, what is my uniqueness? What is it that really makes me stand out before people and makes me feel good that I have um, good abilities? So you're trying to develop this, and anybody in this area requires support, mentoring in this, in this area of competence. The third area is identity. Now with identity, a person is asking, who am I? What do people feel, think I am? Am I secure as a person? Do I like myself? Do I feel confident in myself? Do I feel confident in God? Does God really like me as I am? Is that part of my identity that God loves me and God likes me? The fourth important area during this invention stage is the birthing of dreams. Dreams are birthed throughout this period. And since one is not busy with a lot of responsibility, they have time to feel and think about the future. What do I really want to accomplish? Maybe my goal is to be in politics and become the president and I have a, a, a goal that by 40, that's where I want to be. Maybe my heart is for reaching the world for Jesus and I say I really want to reach the world for Jesus. There are people I admire and I'd like to be like them. Then there is, what do I want to become in my career? Maybe I want to become the best architect there ever was or the best engineer or doctor. And then there's a visualizing of relationships. I want this kind of um, marriage. I want these kinds of children. These are the relationships that I want to have. And so during that stage, we have the leisure of being able to birth these dreams. And amazingly, God puts things in our hearts that will come up later in our lives. What did David look like at, say, about the age of 18? And this is written about him in Samuel, it says, I have seen a son of Jesse who knows how to play the lyra. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, is fine looking, and the Lord is with him. That's how they described David to Saul when Saul was looking for a person to 
play some music for him. And people had been involved in investing in his life in order to get that kind of person at about 18 to look like that. There had been various pur voices of purpose in his life, people investing their time in obedience to God. Let's look at who those are. One is that there's the family and where it comes from and what, what um, contributions it might make. The family is a very key issue in developing a person during the stage and David was developed by the family. He's coming from a family with a good name and it has its roots in Boaz and Ruth who are the great grandparents of David, followed by Obed, then Jesse, who is the father of David. So there's a very strong spiritual heritage that David comes from. And I'm sure he had stories about how Naomi came back in repentance to uh, Bethlehem, together with Ruth, who was a foreigner, and how Ruth loved God, and then this really exciting marriage to Boaz and Obed resulting from that. So those were stories that David must have been told by Jesse who knew the history. Then there's a question there. What stories will your grandchildren be told about you? What stories will your great-grandchildren be told about you? Will the stories that they are told be a voice of purpose in their lives, making them aspire to be the kind of person you want to be and even perhaps um, greater? So those are questions we need to. And our voice can go to four and should go to generations um, after us. Now, how about his mother? What impact did she have on him? She is only mentioned twice. And in Psalm 84, verse 16, it tells us the kind of person his mother was. Okay. Um, Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. David is crying out in a time of need and requiring strength. Then he says, save me because I serve you just as my mother did. So when David is asked, who is your picture of a love for God, a loyalty for God, it is my mother. Now, isn't that very, very significant for a parent? And David is reflecting back to this when he is in trouble and is in need of God and is part of his praying. So what are children? Children are lifelong disciples. And what we put into them carries them through life. We go through the whole of life with them. And as they grow older, they begin to realize, yes, there is wisdom in what my parents taught. And they come back to us. There's a very interesting picture in Esther. Esther is queen. And uh, Mordecai, her father, is around her life. She's very, very successful. She's in her marriage with children. And she has to make a major decision that will realign her to the purpose of God and there's a risk involved. And her father comes to her and tells her, you need to take this decision, and she does. He was able to realign her to the purpose of God because of the relationship he had created with her. So we are called to be that voice of purpose throughout the lives of our children. And as soon as they are born, they're with us, we don't have a choice. The Great Commission applies to us. Jesus wants us to make them disciples. And that's our responsibility. And right through life, right through to the very end, even at the point of death, I'm demonstrating confidence and hope in God. So that's our calling to our children. We are called to our grandchildren to be there, to be involved, to um, be present in order for us to pass on what we know about God. Now, parenting is not natural. Parenting is a very deliberate discipline. And sometimes it goes against our grain. And so it is something that you need to learn. 
So you need to commit yourself to a parenting class and also as part of your ministry you may choose you want to facilitate parenting classes and in this way you're contributing to making many people disciples. Let's look at David um, and other people that were in his life and we will look at the identity building. The family is very key in building identity. Let's look at how David's family might have shaped his sense of um, identity. When Samuel was sent to anoint one of De Jesse's sons as uh, king, all the seven brothers were assembled. And Samuel said, no, it is none of this. And he asked, is there any other one? And Jesse, his father said, there is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. This one was not worth presenting or worth considering. I wonder how that played out with David and whether this happened a lot in the family. But God helped David and built his sense of worth as he walked with him. The siblings are very important in building the identity and sense of worth of the younger children. Let's see with David. David is now um, near the battlefront when Goliath was threatening Israel. And so he's been sent by uh, his father to take some supplies to his older brothers who are um, in the army. And so he sees Goliath approaching and David begins to ask questions. His older brother is very angry and he asks him, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? What was he doing? He was saying, David, you don't have a place here. You should be out there doing the roles that are not as important, that are perhaps despised. Basically, David was really getting excited about what was happening and his brother was killing his dream. Be careful about your children killing the dreams um, of others. What else do they think of him? His brother looks at him and says, I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. Now, this is not a new perception. There's probably some history. And these were the feelings of the older brother, that you're wicked through and through. Now, it's so important as parents to help our children build their identity and the worth of, other, um, of, of the younger children. Who are the other people that are important in building a sense of identity? It is teachers, it is um, coaches, etc. Whilst they build the skills of the child. David, as we heard, was very good at playing the instrument. Somebody must have sat there and worked with that through with him through that so that he could feel you know a sense of confidence encouragement etc the sling was a very important um, weapon for him and we see how it is used somebody must have been there to encourage him on how to use it how to aim etc then a day came when God took all the skills that David had and used them now wasn't it exciting for all the people who had been used in building David's skill to see him come up to the war front or hear about him and take on Goliath? So what does he do when he goes to face Goliath? He brings in his faith, he brings in his heart, bravery, skills, and David is ready at the age of 15, 18. God has been through other people preparing him for this one defining moment. What does that tell us? We have an input in people who are younger than ourselves, in our children as well, to give them all the skills they need and let God define where they're going. Let's see how this shows up in David's confrontation with um, Goliath. Goliath is threatening and he says, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, 
and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. What a proud moment for those that had been involved in David's life and preparing him. And so David has a run of success thereafter for about seven years. And um, Saul liked him initially, and he was given a role in the army. He played it well. The other leaders really got to, to like him. The whole country loved David because he led Israel and Judah in battles, and they won to the point that they began seeing him as the person who was making it happen and began singing, Saul, the king, killed his thousand, but David killed his ten thousands. Now that got David in trouble. Saul becomes jealous and begins to go after the life of David. So David is on the run for his life. It's going to be a painful period. It's going to be a period of suffering. It's going to be a whole eight years of that. Now, it could have seemed wasteful, it could have seemed unnecessary, but this was the tool that God was using to shape David. What were his mentors thinking? His mentors, the people who were speaking into his life, his disciples must have been saying, we don't understand what's happening. We had such a successful run. Is this thing over? Have we been wasting our time? Really, God was doing perhaps his best work in preparing David. And so we need to know the place of suffering in a person we're mentoring, a person we're developing, and even in our own children at this stage of life. So, and there can be a period where we feel we don't really understand. It's, let's look at um, Job in his suffering. Job said, I do not find God as I look for him. I do not see him. I catch a glimpse of him, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So God is preparing the young person or the person that we're dealing with and really refining him for his purposes. And we need to recognize that. And so as a mentor, as a disciple, what do I do? I keep believing God is doing his best. I keep focusing the person that God has given me on the purpose of God and what he wants to accomplish. So David is now running for his life and to help him, he's got a little army. Now that little army is not exactly what you'd call the greatest. David has been fighting with a very disciplined army when he was doing battles for Judah and for Israel. And so, what does he get for an army that he is working with? And I like to call this mentoring the mob. And that's what David is given in the hardest moments of his life to mentor this mob. And look how they're described. Um, Samuel 22, First Samuel 22. All those who are in distress, in debt, discontented, gathered around him. They gathered around um, David. And it's also said that they were evil men and troublemakers. And there were about 400 of them. And so God says, this is your army. Make them godly men. You can imagine the amount of fighting, squabbling there was amongst those 500 men with those characteristics just mentioned. He did not get to choose promising men. But those are the men that God has, had given him. And the preparation was good because if he was going to really enforce justice in his country, he needed to know how to deal with this, um, uh, these kinds of infighting and difficult people. Let's look at two examples of the way David mentors this mob, these men um, who you would never want to be part of your team. Right? So at one point, they want to go out and um, they, they're running around, running for their lives, and they hear that this particular town called Kela is under attack from the Philistines. And so David says, the Philistines are our enemies. Let us go and save Kela. And he tells his people that. And so the people say, but David, even here in Judah, we are afraid. 
How much more then if we go to Kela against the Philistine forces? David is not a good idea. But David had had a previous conversation with God and he had, God had told him, go attack the Philistines and save Kela, an instruction. And it's like David, the men ask him, did you really hear right from God? Did he instruct you that way? Okay, men, let me go back to God. Once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go down to Kela, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So all these roguish guys are seeing David have this communication with God. They doubt it. He reaffirms and he goes into battle. God leads them. They win. Um, they worship. They hear him putting together some psalms, writing them. And they really begin to recognize the power of God and begin to follow David. What was David's method? David's primary method in mentoring and discipling these people was the reality of God in his life that he was able to bring into his situation and have confidence in God. It was the nearness of God that really helped him move forward and get them to follow him. Let's look at another example that taught that David used to teach them how to follow God. And it was submit to God's way, submit to God's form of justice, his plan and his methods. They were going to be fighting for a long time, many years to come, and they needed to learn how to depend on God and to fight for their lives in God's way. So they go out to, um, they, Saul has come looking for them and they get into a situation whereby they walk into his tent, he is asleep, and Abishai, one of the people that go down with David, tells David, let us kill this man. This is the opportunity. In fact, God's, God has said this. And David says, do not destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, David said, the Lord himself will strike Saul down, or his time will come and he will die. He will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. So he was getting his people to submit to who God was, God's timing and God's justice. So again, it is his belief in God and how God works that helped him focus these men. Now these men end up being a very great army in God's purpose. Remember, Abraham had been promised a lot of land. This is the core of the army that made that possible, to fulfill that promise. And Israel, under David, got to its largest geographical expan expanse, and it was through some of these men. Now, when David's 30 men are mentioned, and what miracles they performed in battle, and the faith that they displayed, I wonder how many of these were amongst those. So whatever men God gives us and gives us a goal, he is able to do much, much more than we ever um, can imagine. As Saul continues to pursue David, and this is many, many years, David gets in survival mode. Remember now, he is running, they are on the run. You're talking about 500 men, and maybe you're talking about 3,000 people in total for whom food has to be found, they have to be moved, and so on. So he is harassed, they are hungry, the helplessness you know, comes in sometimes. And so David comes across a guy called Nabal, a very wealthy man, for whom he had looked after the sheep and protected them from being raided by other people. This was a practice that was common. Okay? Now Nabal has an opportunity to be a voice of purpose in the life of David when David is in need. But he misses the opportunity of being that voice of purpose. Now just as an aside, there is no neutral in being a voice of purpose. 
God created us for that, designed us for that, and called us to that. There is such a thing as the sin of doing nothing. Remember the person who buried his talent? What did Jesus call that person? He called him a lazy and wicked servant. So we cannot be neutral in this business of being a voice of purpose, of mentoring and discipling others. Let's see how Nabal responds and misses his opportunity. So having protected his sheep, David would ask, and rightly so, give me something for my men to eat and, the, and their families. Because it was sheep shearing time and Nabal was having a great time with his servants. And so he said, please give your servant and your son David whatever you can find for them. Then Nabal answered, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why did Nabal do this? Why did he miss the opportunity? He missed the opportunity because he had no connection with God that he could evaluate the request of David. He saw facts as they were on the ground. Who, who was David? David was a nobody. On the ground, he was a nobody. He was running away from Saul. Many servants are running away from their masters. That's all he could see now here on the ground, the facts as they are. He missed seeing where God was going with David by simply looking at the facts on the ground. The second thing that he, he did was because he didn't have a vital relationship with God, his heart and his character didn't allow him to give and to give back to um, David and other situations that might have been necessary. He became a very self-centered person and he missed the opportunity to be of use to David and to the kingdom and where he was going. But his wife was exactly the opposite and we'll see some more about her. So when David is brought back this reply, who is David, who is the son of Jesse? David is really, really angry. And remember, he's really been running for a long time. He's really harassed. And so David in his anger forgets to even pray or trust God. And he says, I'm going to do what I need to do to extract you know, some revenge here. And then he says, may God deal with David, be it so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him, of all who belong to Nabal, Samuel, 1 Samuel 25. And so he goes out and there's a dark side that's coming from him. This person who had spared the, 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 the life of uh, Saul is now saying, I'm going to kill um, every ma male in that family. And so he goes out to do that. And God realizes that this is not good for David. And he sends a woman, a woman of wisdom. That woman of wisdom is Abigail who is Nabal's wife, to protect David from the sin that he was about to commit that would have reflected on um, his, his, his record. And so she hears about it from one of the servants. And being, as described in the scriptures, intelligent, she quickly puts together food for David and doesn't even tell David, uh, her husband Nabal where she's going. And she goes out and meets um, David in his anger and his men are on really coming out to, to, to do um, the revenge, on a revenge mission. Okay? She is operating very differently. She operates on a level of faith. What do we mean? Apart from Nabal who was saying who is this, his wife sees very differently and this is what she says. As she meets David, who is now very angry and coming out. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles. God will appoint you ruler over Israel. And when he appoints you ruler over Israel, David, I do not want you to have on your conscience 
this burden of bloodshed that was unnecessary and having taken revenge for yourself. yourself. And so because she's got the eyes of faith, because she sees the truth about people and where they're going from God's standpoint, other than the facts as they are on the ground, as Nabal saw, she's able to see it differently and able to restrain David and bring him back to his purpose. She's concerned about his walk with God. She's concerned about the purpose for the future. And David hears God speaking through her. And what does he say? Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself. So because of her relationship with God, because she could sense where God was going with people and trying to prevent them from evil, she became a significant voice of purpose in David's life. Now, Nabal dies and David calls and marries um, Abigail. Now, you can imagine how David could have been helped by Abigail in the rest of their relationship if he continued to listen to her, if she continued to be a voice of purpose in his life. Okay. Now, let's just stop here for a while and look at this as applies to, to our marriages. Where is God going with your spouse? Do you see yourself as one who God is using to be a voice of purpose, to, make, to direct him to where God wants him to be or direct her to the kind of person God wants her to be? Do you see that as part of the Great Commission within your very closest context? What qualities do you need to have? And we saw the qualities Abigail had. What qualities do you need to have to redirect your spouse to the calling and the purpose of God? How can I become a voice of purpose in that relationship, in that marriage? Let us look at another relationship that was very significant in supporting and shaping David. Jonathan was one of those men in the Bible who really served the interests of God above his own and ended up paying a high price for it. Dave, Jonathan was in David's life for about 15 years from the time that they met to the time that he dies. The age difference between Jonathan and David is actually huge. You know, we normally look at them as peers, but going according to Steve Rudd's chronology, Jonathan is 27 years older than David. The, y the, young, the youngest I've found Jonathan to be is about 10 years older. But anyway, he's an older person. Jonathan is the heir to the throne and understands that. Now, after Goliath is killed, J Jonathan is really drawn to David. And what does he do? 1 Samuel um, 18, Jonathan took off his robe that he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. What was he doing when he did that? He was saying, I am giving up my place in the future as heir to the throne. This is the kind of man that Israel needs in order to go where God wants this country to go. I feel like he can do it, and I'm convinced about that. And I'm giving up kingship for him. So he gave up that. Now you can see he's going to be on a collision course with his father, Saul, because his father, Saul, wants their family name to continue against the will of God. And so he's ready to enter into conflict with his own father. And his father really feels like the kingship needs to be stayed. So he, so, so he gets insulted by his dad. He says, one day over dinner, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't you know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, 
neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for me, for he must die. They're going in totally opposite directions. Jonathan is very upset because his father wants to kill David. So he says, what has David done to deserve death? Now, Saul is in no mood to be questioned and he reaches for his spear and he throws it towards Jonathan and Jonathan ducks. So Jonathan escapes the spear that could have killed him in the defense of his friend David. Later on, Saul asks his men, my son Jonathan and David have made a covenant. They want to overthrow him. And so here is Jonathan, the son of the king, being accused of a conspiracy. So for the next eight years, Jonathan is going to be watched as being a conspirator and somebody that needs to be um, watched. Later on, as the battle rages, Jonathan comes back into David's life. It's getting serious, it's getting heavy, David is running away, Saul has mobilized his army again looking for David. And so whilst David was in the desert, um, Jonathan came to him and it says that Jonathan helped him find his strength in God. And that's what you do as a mentor, as a discipler, in a difficult situation, you help your person find strength in God because that's whom he needs to know in order to go to where God is going. So Jonathan tells him, don't be afraid. My father's soul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king and I will be second to you. 1 Samuel 23. What did Jonathan do? Jonathan left his level of comfort, his comfort zone within the palace, within his place at um, Saul's side in order to go and look after God's interests in the life of David. He risked being caught for b being subversive. Okay? He went there and he listened to the difficulties that David was having. He felt the fear that David was, f was feeling and he pointed him towards God and he affirmed him that you will be king. And that's where God was going with David and Jonathan wanted him to know you will be fine in the hands of God and his purpose for you. David and Jonathan don't get to meet again after that, but he had served his purpose in strengthening and directing David and he had given up, paid the price for doing that. Let's go on to a significant voice of purpose in the life of um, David, and it is Samuel. And they meet twice or thrice, at least for in the record, um, during David's life. Let's look at Samuel and where he's coming from. Samuel had raised two sons, and when he was 52 years old, he made them leaders in Israel. He had mentored them and directed them. He had brought them up. And this was a proud moment for him when his sons get to a stage whereby he can hand over the leadership. Being a judge, he would hand it over to um, his sons. But they were different. And it didn't turn out to be the proud moment that he expected. The scriptures say, when, Saul, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders, but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside to dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Exactly the opposite of what um, Samuel was and what he expected of them and what the rest of the country expected of them. So there was a deep disappointment on the side of Samuel and of course there was shame to go with it. After all these years, after having led so, so greatly, my sons do not follow in this. I don't produce the leaders I expected to or God expected me to. And so on the back of that, God tells him, okay, leave your sons, go and appoint a king for Israel. And so he goes and he appoints Saul as king. 
And Saul starts off and, 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 and perhaps it goes well for a little while, but after 27 years, God sends Saul to go and completely kill the Amalekites and leave nothing. And Saul fails to do that. He fails God entirely. So that is the second failing that he has as a person who's trying to raise leaders for God in, the, in Israel. And so he can look back. I spent 30 years raising my sons. I spent 27 years hanging around Saul. So you're saying 57 years of my life has just gone to nothing? What do I have to show for all the work that I've been doing? What do I have to show for being here? Now, at that time, Samuel is pushing 80. He's 80 years old when Saul is failing. Samuel grieves and mourns over Saul and what Saul has become. And God tells him, how long will you mourn for Saul? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. <sighs> Lord, we've been at this. They were my own children. Then there was Saul here, 80. You're sending me out to try again. And now you're sending me to a 15-year-old grandson, if you like. Really, at 80, why don't you give that job to somebody else? And <laughs> let's create this conversation. God says, age is a number when it comes to being a voice of purpose. I still want you to pick up, go slowly, however long it takes you, go and anoint him, David King. And he does that, and all seems to go well in David's life. Seven years later, after the anointing, David, as we've said, runs into trouble, and Saul is trying to kill him. Where does David run? The go-to person for David is the person who anointed him. So he goes to Samuel, obviously trying to find some support and some protection. So when David fled, he went to Samuel at Ramah, and he told him all that Saul had done to him. 1 Samuel 19. Here is a man close to 90 being told of all the difficulties that David, the one he anointed, was having. Lord, I thought this third one, we were going to have some um, success with it. And also Saul is being, exp uh, sorry, also Samuel is being exposed at this stage. You know I'm close to 90. Why are you exposing me to Saul? You know how dangerous the man is. And I can imagine David telling him, you know what, this was not my idea. You came to our home, you anointed me. You've got to help me out. And you guys know the story. What God does is give, gives um, David protection, Saul comes out to look for David and he reaches there and the power of God overcomes him and he prophesies and he lies down day and night. Samuel will soon die after that. Now, he is dying four years from the time David will become king. He dies not knowing whether David will succeed and how Saul will pursue him and harass him. He doesn't know what will happen, but he dies believing that God accomplishes his purpose, even though I've seen a failure twice. Okay? Now, we don't know how he died. He may have died a disappointed person, a sad person, feeling a sense of um, failure, no leaders raised. Israel may not even have been really walking with God because there was no king and support from the top. And so that's how he dies. Let's look at other people also. Moses has little to show by the end of his life. And God tells him, you have spent 40 years with these guys. Let me tell you what will happen. As soon as you die, these people will soon prostitute themselves to foreign gods and of the lands they are entering. 
They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. Deuteronomy 31. That's what God has to present to him. You are not really going to have an effect on these people for whom you have written all these five books of the Old Testament and all the training you've given them. You're not really going to have an effect on them. Afterwards, when you go to the New Testament, what does it say about God's view of uh, Moses? In Hebrews 3.5, it says, Moses was faithful as a servant in, God's, in all God's house. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. So, as people who mentor, as disciple makers, what is God looking for from us? God wants us to focus on faithfulness and not focus primarily on the fruit or our own success. And God has a very high regard for these two men we've just mentioned, for Samuel and for Moses. In Jeremiah 15, when God talks about Israel being exiled into Babylon as a discipline, he's saying, this is done. I'm finished with, um, with Judah. They will go into captivity. And then he says, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out for this people. Let them go away from my presence. What is God saying? God is saying, I really have a high sense of regard for these two men. They have been faithful, although they may not have had a lot to show for their lives. So Samuel dies. And as usual, God continues with his work in David's life. He brings Gad, another prophet, who is a voice of purpose and begins to help David along. David is still running. With Samuel, his voice of purpose and his protector dead and buried, Saul now really has confidence to go out and pursue David. David, feeling a sense of loneliness and lack of um, support, is discouraged. He's fearful. He's doubtful. In fact, he even becomes faithless. Remember, he's been running for seven years. What he doesn't know is that he's about one year from kingship. So in his tiredness, he gets into a backslidden state in his life. And this is what he says. David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines, and there Saul will not look for me. When Saul was told that David has fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. What did, what did David do when he did this? David lost sight of God's promises of protection. God had protected him for seven years in very um, significant ways. And now he throws the towel in. Let me go to where I can take it easier and I am safe and Saul will not come out looking for me. I am tired of this faith thing and believing. And so what does he do? He leaves the presence of God by leaving Israel. Let me go where I don't have to depend on God. That's what he's basically, you know, saying. And when he does that, a lot of things happen to his heart. He spends 14 months in Gath, in Philistine country. He does not pray. We don't hear of any Psalms. And then he becomes cruel, he becomes deceptive, he attacks other communities, he kills women and children because he doesn't want word to come back to the Philistines that um, he was attacking other people besides Israel, which is what he was um, deceiving them that he was doing. And so there's a cruelty in his life in order to protect uh, himself. Now, if Abigail was around, and she was, if she spoke, 
What would she have said? And maybe that conversation was there with Abigail. I would imagine Abigail would have told him, are you going to throw away all those seven years of trust? Why don't we stay there where God will come through for us again as he has come through in the past? Now that would have been being a voice of purpose um, in his life. Once David was in um, Gath, he got deeper and deeper into evil. And that's what happens when people move away from the presence of God and from his protection. They just go deeper. His parents in Moab, because that's where they were for, prote for protection under the king, they must have been wondering, what's happening to our son David? How can he go to the Philistines? He killed Goliath and now he is with them. God who was back in Judah must have been wondering, how do I get to David? Um, Jonathan was wondering, what's happened to my friend? And so David was in a place that he was not reachable. And when people walk away from God, people who were mentoring, supporting, this may be a friend, it could be a child, and so on, and it's very hard you know, to reach them. What do we do? Okay. Um, and so, so David gets deeper and deeper. Now, after 14 months, the Philistines are planning an assault on Israel. And David is told, come and be part of this campaign for us to fight Israel. And then David says, and this shows how deep he had gone. I, you will see, Akish, King Akish, you will see what I can do when I go out to battle with you. And then Akish tells him, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. That's how deep and enslaved he was going to be. And nobody there could turn him around. But God was the one who decided to intervene since there was no other voice of purpose that David was listening to. The generals, unbelieving people, told King Akish, send this man away. He could betray us in the battle and go back to the side of Israel. The second way God got through to David was to bring the Amalekites to attack his tent, take away all the children, the women, and everything they had. And that caused the army of Israel, sorry, the army that David had and the men that were around him to want to stone David and to kill him. And it says that um, David was greatly distressed because the men who were with him were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in his spirit because of his son and daughters but David found strength in the Lord his God. That's the first time in 14 months that we're being told David found strength in the Lord his God. And God had to get him to that place. And then he told himself, this is not the place to be. Finally, God had gotten to him. There is a place where as a disciple maker, as a mentor, as a parent, as a friend, you step back and you can't reach that person and you've got to believe that God has a purpose and God will go and find that person and bring them back. And as soon as David comes out of um, Philistine, he hears that the battle in which he was going to fight and um, against Saul and Jonathan and Israel, Saul died in that battle. And so now it's obvious he's going to be king. You would assume that that's a great moment, but it's an anticlimax for, it would be an anticlimax for David, I would, I would assume, because if David had only stayed in one more year, he would have come, up with a come out with a whole lot more confidence as he began his leadership. Now, as a disciple maker himself, in those 14 months, and as the mentor who mentored the mob, what did he do for his men during those 14 months? He brought them to a point whereby it's anything can go. He made them, give them a sense of expedience. It is survival. And he probably undid some of the work that he had done in building their faith. 
What does that tell us? That the, the failure of a mentor or a disciple maker can be great and lead a lot of people astray. So all is not lost. God came out and in his mercy rescued David and David becomes king in Hebron and now he's gotten to where God wanted him to be as king. This now begins a stage whereby he's investing in other people and investing in the kingdom and we'll pick up that story of the investment stage of life when we come back next Sunday. Let me lead us in a moment of prayer as we close. Father, I want to thank you for the roles that you give us in the children, teenagers, and young people you give us in our lives as parents, as mentors, as disciple makers. I want to pray that you will show us the significance of the role you've given us in forming these lives and giving them to you and for you to bring them to moments and events that are defining and taking them forward. Thank you for the kind of people that you brought around David, people who may not have been of promise, and thank you for the people that you bring into our lives who we may feel don't have a lot of promise. But God, help us to have your eyes. Protect us from seeing things as Nabal did, facts on the ground, and give us the eyes of um, Abigail, who is able to see the truth as God sees it. Help us to be able to see where you're taking people, Lord. Help us to see what you want to do in their lives and with them. And as we learn from people like Jonathan, help us to be able to pay the price, to give up what we need to give up in order to be that voice of purpose on your behalf and your, your ends. Lord, as we look at Samuel, we want to pray that you will help us persevere and not be discouraged by any failures in our lives. Because, God, you want our faithfulness. And what we want to hear from you, God, is well done, good and faithful servant. So, Lord, help us to be persevering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yeah.